Welcome to a concept module on artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, and the Internet of Things. It's based on partially on the body of knowledge area for geocomputation and is brought to you by the Geotech Center, a National Science Foundation grant to help compute community colleges expand the geospatial workforce. So artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, and Internet of Things are uh, briefly introduced in this concept module. It is going to provide a historical perspective on what really led to the development or the ability to uh, use these tools. And we're going to look at some ways that they are currently used in different applications and provide some examples how some of the more advanced analysis tools use these topics, especially in geospatial technology related applications. Uh, it will also encourage more in-depth study by providing links to additional resources at, both within the slides and at the end of the presentation. So artificial intelligence to me is really an umbrella term for the other terms. And if we think about it, you know, science fiction has promoted the vision of the machines with human abilities. You know, the robots we see or that look like humans, act like humans, and can think and work on complex tasks. While scientists have uh, theoretically tried to understand just how humans think and, and try to mimic that intelligence and help machines do the same thing, really until recently the technology just did not provide the ability to uh, allow these devices to do this. You know, in the past the computers, software, data storage, access, and communication between the devices were just too slow or just too limited to carry any out anything but very, very simple tasks. So we're going from that artificial intelligence science fiction to almost reality. Uh, we're not quite there yet, but it's getting uh, closer. So um, we're going to look at computing, hardware and software, data science, especially the, the volume of data and the access and sharing that data. And then really communication between all of these devices and using algorithms and the internet and sensors. Uh, so first we'll just do a quick review of, of why we are where we are now, but where we started from. So computing power, power really looking from that uh, mainframe to server farms and, and you know more complex usable software. So it used to be that you had a huge room and, and really the computer was pretty limited in what it could do. Once we got personal computers, we were able to do more things, but still um, data sharing on those mainframes were, was difficult. We used to have stacks and stacks of punch cards or data sharing was by shipping uh, magnetic tapes between sites. As PCs improved, we had better uh, access and function increasing functionality, but we still had li limited numbers of CPUs, memory, random access mem memory, and a pretty, at first, uh, primitive user interface. We had the big floppy disks, and then we went to the smaller ones and CDs and DVDs, but data sharing was still somewhat difficult. Also, the PCs increased in their capabilities, so we went from a single precision 8-bit to double precision 16-bit. And no longer we were limited to one CPU, but we could have multiple CPUs and increasing RAM and memory. One really big uh, step was taken with gaming. Gaming really uh, pushed the uh, development of uh, graphic cards, which really increased what could be done. And then the internet, once uh, it started, we could share data and of course, then the development of cloud computing. So really from just data where the scientist may have his tables and books or other hard copy ways to uh, write down what his data from his research was, we went to digital data. So we could store it in a computer memory or multiple tapes within an organization. Still, sharing was a problem. You could do peer-to-peer -peer, peer -peer computer sharing. We had those wonderful dial-up modems. I can still hear it in my mind. And then we could still mail our hard, hard disks or floppy disks 
uh, via snail mail. Along came the internet and sharing became much uh, easier, but still there was problems with bandwidth and the size of the data, and then processing was still a problem. Once we had com cloud computing though, where we could distribute uh, clusters of server farms and ha develop uh, protocols for storing, sharing, and processing large data on multiple machines, uh, we could do a lot more. So development of big data, data science, and communication between devices was essential for uh, machine learning and for deeper learning. So two of the ones I'm going to talk about are machine learning and deep learning. So this is a quote from a website that is linked below. Machine learning uses algorithms that train on data sets to make predictions or take actions in order to optimize some system. So these algorithms can be many, many different things. And we see clustering, decision trees, uh, random forests, Bayesian modeling, all sorts of gaming theory, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And using these algorithms and data to make decisions that are then compared against a cor uh, correct action or decision. And we're going to look at uh, how these are trained in a minute. Deep learning is uh, generally uses similar algorithms, but it's modeled more on a simplification of how the human brain works. Uh, so you often hear the term neural networks, where some layers within this neural network on the, uh, in deep learning are layers and they are hidden or deep. So when we think about a human brain, we have a hundred billion neurons and they're all connected, interconnected these neurons through dendrites and we have over a hundred million connections. So we can make decisions with little conscience input. Deep learning structures then, they have neurons and neural networks, so the connections and neurons and they're arranged in layers with input connected to hidden layers of neurons that can adjust the outcome and provide outputs. And we're going to take a look at that in a minute. I'm going to look at one example, and that's remote sensing image processing, so part of the geospatial technology uh, functions. And it's really going from machine learning into deep learning. So for machine learning, we're going to look at image classification techniques. And there's really two types, supervised classification and unsupervised classification. So imagery from remote sensing is made up of multiple layers of pixels with brightness values in each of the pixels for each of the uh, images in the set. These brightness values then are used by the two techniques, supervised or unsupervised. In supervised, a human selects the pixels in an image and provides brightness, which provide brightness values for a specific type of feature. So the human looks at the image and says, mm, I think this is water, and I'm going to create a training set that these values that are similar to the one that I'm picking for water should be used by the software to identify other uh, pixels that are water. And it goes through and you can do buildings and soil and vegetation and all different things. But you create a training set of pixel values that the computer then uses. So the software then uses these values and classifies those images in the picture pixel into clusters of like features. The human then comes back in and, and color codes those features appropriately. So Water probably blue, vegetation green, buildings tan or brown, roads. And you can rerun this process to eliminate small clusters. Unsupervised classification, this time the computer does most of the work up front. You don't create a training set. It looks at all the pixels and it clusters together pixel values that are alike together without human input. So it generates these clusters and the human then comes in and looks at those clusters and color codes those clusters into features that it believes uh, they represent. So again, you would look at different features. If you think it's water, you'd probably cluster it and color it blue, vegetation green. 
and it can be repeated. Uh, reclustering can occur to combine small clusters or eliminate them. Moving from that machine learning is to deep learning. And instead of looking at pixels, you, the software uses large uh, data sets and algorithms and recognizes like features. And it can use various things like edges, colors, shapes, cultural features, rather than individual pixels. So like objects are clustered into features, such as roads, water bodies, swimming pools we've seen. So it is more um, without human input. Of course, you can come back in and, and, and correct some of those things too. We we'll take a closer look at deep learning and neural networks. So here is a little illustration of a very simple uh, neural network. So we have neurons, and those are the little white circles. We have networks, and those are the black uh, arrows pointing from the input layer to the hidden layers and to the output layer. And you have activations or algorithms that say, OK, um, from its large training set and sample data and, and known outputs, here's what that hidden layer should weight these. And the second hidden layer may say, these are the biases. And going through all those connections, I'm going to output what I think this uh, final output layer should mean. So the output solves whatever the problem is. This is an image recognition using neural networks. And it's uh, chapter one from the three blue, one brown YouTube videos. And the link to it is on the lower left bottom. It's uh, putting a 9 on a 28 by 28 pixel grid. And all of the input layers represent one of those pixels. So here there are 784 neurons in that input layer. They're all the neurons in the first layer are connected to neurons in the next layer, which is the first hidden layer. And neurons are activated if part of that 9 is de detected. There are two hidden layers, and each of these have 16 neurons. And 16 is just an arbitrary number here at, for this example. It can be more, it could be less. So those hidden layers are trained uh, using a very large data set of known inputs and outputs. And it develops a rule with biases and weights uh, that are applied when the uh, neurons are activated in that first uh, input layer through the second hidden layer to the third, first hidden layer to the second hidden layer, and finally interconnected to the uh, output layer. It uses that training set uh, to activate edges and patterns, and it will include those weights and biases. And if you think about it, there are 784 neurons in that first input layer. And there are 16 and 16 in each of the two hidden layers. So there are over 200,000 connections. The output layer then has 0 to 9. And uh, using the training set and the correct outputs, it determines that it's a 9. Now this is a simple view of this process of training. And the real one would use uh, advanced mathematics to develop those hidden layers. These are just some examples of machine learning, deep learning, and Internet of Things. So if you think about it, language recognition. Your spam filter for your email actually uses a, an algorithm on a neural network where a large, extremely large uh, data set of spam uh, emails are um, trained finding commonalities and when they recognize those they they recognize your spam and put it in your junk folder i always wondered how they did the next word when you start typing a text message often it comes out with a correct one again it's a huge data set millions of entries and language and determining what's going to probably be next and the same one is used to automatically fill in the next word or two when you're entering a search engine search uh, definition.
course, they're used for autonomous vehicles. So they're high speed and complex interactions. And we're going to take a closer look at that. But there's image recognition, uh, two way sharing of roadway information with sensors, vehicle controls and other vehicles, and then also high speed inter, uh, data processing and communication. We see it on our te television. If we look at the weather, weather channel, uh, if there's a fire in our area, if you got to uh, wildfire sites and pandemics, uh, all of these things use uh, large data sets to train and do um, deep learning. One of them that was used recently was by the Blue Dot company in Canada. It had an artificial artificial intelligence or deep learning algorithm that looked at outbreak science and they actually correctly identified that uh, as an early alert when they only had 27 cases in Wuhan, China. Uh, California Governor's uh, Gavin Newsom also used it uh, from Blue Dot, Esri and Facebook and others and combined it with mapping technologies and cell phone data to predict which hospitals would be hardest hit so they could be prepared. So they were combining data modeling and deep learning and deep uh, machine learning to identify these hotspot areas. Uh, you can read about the, both of these at the uh, URL on the lower part of the slide. So Internet of Things. So uh, you need to control something and you want to do it without human intervention. There are devices out there, hardware and software algorithms, and there are multiple different kinds of sensors, radar, LIDAR, GPS or GNSS, sonar, thermal, all sorts of different sensors that are out there, and they all com can communicate via the Internet. It could be a simple Internet of Things. Just think about your house. Our furnace is disconnected from uh, a, a controller, it sends, I have, we have a sensor that senses the temperature and when it's preset by our computer to go on at a certain temperature or go off at another temperature, it is all controlled via uh, hard uh, sensors rather than being hardwired to the furnace. The one I mentioned earlier on autonomous vehicles or self-driving cars, you know, cars need to know where they are, so they, we have GNSS in them. And they have multiple sensors uh, for uh, within the vehicle, within roads, and within other vehicles. So they recognize each other. They all communicate via the internet and use uh, software and algorithms to develop, uh, to define where the vehicle is and keep it safely on the road and away from trees and vehicles and people and other things. And it's really interesting, but the problem is speed. Uh, these vehicles use these sensors, they sense the object that is sent uh, to the vehicle, it's told that here is the sensor, uh, there is another one that goes out and says, okay, it, you, it calculates actually you, uh, what needs to be done, and then resends that information based on the sensor's information, and it outputs an instruction to your vehicle. And it makes a suggestion, hopefully the vehicle does, uh, for the suggested maneuver. And these are all very fast, like in nine nanoseconds or less, but this may be too slow, depending on the speed of the vehicle and what is happening. So we're, the last thing I'm going to talk about is cobots. So cobots are cooperation between machines and humans, and they work in response to sensors and human motions or actions, and they may work in the same space as the human and work with them or may work separate in different uh, workspaces. Uh, it's an interaction in contrast to that true robot that, you know, is just autonomous and does everything on its own without any human interaction. So that here there is a human, there is a machine, there are devices with software algorithms that allow this uh, man and machine cooperation. This is an example of a cobot, and it's uh, actually my pontoon boat. And you can see me sitting in my pontoon boat on the lower left. So it's an interaction between a person, a machine, 
our trolling motor, sensors and software all working together. And the data is, is fairly sophisticated data. GPS uh, is uh, collected using our hummingbird fish finder. It has sonar sensors that collect data uh, about the depth of the water and objects in the water column and the bottom surface. And it has size scanning uh, sonar for the lake bottom. The machine, actually, the uh, Hummingbird Fish Finder, as you uh, drive your boat along the surface of the water, it can develop a depth contour map. And this one, uh, in the center part of this map, you can see a map, the, the shoreline, and various contours. And this was all created using the Hummingbird Fish Finder that then created a contour map of the, the, the lake. Once that contour map is uh, created, you can then tell the fish finder, okay, trolling motor, fish finder, I want you to keep on the same contour, and it will steer the boat without human intervention along that contour. So the hummingbird has created those uh, vector layers and, and the trolling motor and the interaction keep it on that vector layer. Uh, that you can also see that this uh, is giving us the temperature of the water, the time of day is 11.48 a.m. It's got a north arrow, it's telling us our speed. So it's really quite interesting. And you can see in the water column on the right, the white layer is the uh, surface to the uh, depth of the lake. Uh, between the red and, and the white, you see some probably algae and probably some fish. On the bottom part where it's dark, this is the side scanning sonar. This, in conclusion, this is a, provides really a brief review of artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, and Internet of Things. And it does not include really much of the software applications or high level math, both linear algebra and matrices, really needed to completely understand these concepts. Many uh, geospatial software applications, both browser-based and, and uh, installed software, use tools that are based on machine learning and deep learning. And if you use these tools, you really should investigate exactly what the tools are doing and, and what type of uh, data that it's used as a training set. Below are some links to information for more uh, topics on the machine learning and artificial networks. and you can also search online. There's many more resources out there. There are other uh, concept modules on the geotechcenter.org webpage. Uh, we hope to create quizzes for these and uh, set up a way for you to earn a micro badge. There's also model courses and a lot of other resources. If you have any questions, please contact me. My name is there and my email address. Thank you very much.